Uh, glad that you're here today. We are continuing our series, Girls on Fire. Uh, we are looking over the course of the series at some modern lessons that we get from ancient women, women whose stories we read in the Bible. Uh, we have an anchor verse that's found in the book of Malachi that says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And what we understand from that is that the stories that we read, that we learn from, even though they were written hundreds and hundreds of years ago, uh, they're stories that have uh, meaning and impact and significance for us today. And so we're going to be looking at another one of these stories. How many of you know that sometimes we learn lessons from uh, people's wise decisions and sometimes we learn lessons from people who don't make wise decisions, right? Uh, and oftentimes, hopefully, we can learn from people's uh, unwise decisions so we don't make those same decisions ourselves. So, my name is Josh. Glad that you're here today. Uh, we <clears throat> uh, had started this a couple weeks ago, and uh, today we're going to be looking in the book of Judges, uh, a story uh, about a man and a woman that has to do with romantic love. How many of you love romantic love? No? Okay. Um, a couple of you. A couple of you. Some of you are like, I don't believe in it. I don't even really, I'm not sure that it exists. Well, even though we're going to be reading about romantic love, the, the lesson that we draw from it uh, really has impact for uh, many, relation, the many kinds of relationships that we have uh, in our lives. So I don't want you to get too tied up in just uh, the love relationship, as important as that one may be. Now, um, has anybody here ever been uh, taken advantage of? Used? Anybody? By your kids. <laughs> when do kids act the best? When do they behave themselves the most? When they want something, right? You can tell. The tide has turned all of a sudden. You know, they're talking sweetly, right? They're obeying. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Maybe even they're being proactive and, and doing something completely uh, unexpected. And, and, and what do you say to that child? What do you want, right? Because we know. We know. We know when we're getting used sometimes. Sometimes we don't. Right? Sometimes the blinders are completely on and we don't even know when we're being manipulated and used. But the fact is, uh, sometimes people leverage relationships and they leverage the heart of another person in order for their own benefit. And that's a problem. Relationships were given to us as a gift. God created us to be relational beings. He created us to have a relationship with him and he created us to enjoy relationships with one another. Right? Starting with the relationship between a husband and wife followed by that of children and then grandchildren and siblings and friends, right? And so we in our lives today, we experience a myriad of relationships uh, that range, you know, from extremely intimate to fairly casual. And then we have relationships that maybe even kind of go beyond that, that, that we wouldn't even call relationships. But because we are human beings in a world with other human beings, any encounter that we have with another person requires some measure of relatability. And it's important for us to understand what our responsibilities are in those relationships. How many of you know that you even have responsibilities in those relationships? Like we think that the relationships are there just for our benefit. And as much as they are a gift from God, we also have uh, responsibilities when it comes to the care and the concern that we express to other people uh, through that relationship, through the way that we talk, through the way that we behave and all that. And so we're going to get an example from the Bible uh, about uh, such a, a relationship that, that, that really went terribly wrong. It was really never bound for anything successful in the first place, but did definitely uh, go wrong. So when relationships are supposed to be a gift and they instead turn because you and I are we're broken people and we're selfish and we want our own way, and so sometimes we take advantage of other people, uh, that's just a reflection of the fact that we live in a broken world. Right? And that kind of thing happens. We chalk it up to just being, hey, that's part of life. You know, heartbreak. Have you ever been in love with somebody and they broke your heart? And we think, you know, it's difficult during that time. Then down the road, we just say, well, that's just part of life. And when somebody that we know experiences that, we say, I'll pat them on the back. Hey, you know, it just, it happens. Right? And uh, I want to remind us that that is not the ideal, that that is not what God created us for, ultimately. And we, as people who are following Christ and want to experience what Christ has for our lives, we want to be doing everything we can to turn the tide and be sure that we're fulfilling our responsibilities uh, in life. Now, that doesn't mean that 
It's going to be wrong. You know, you're in a romantic relationship with somebody, a boyfriend or girlfriend, and, and you decide at some point that you're just, you know, it's, it's, there's no future in it. It doesn't mean that, you know, that you're forbidden from ending that relationship, from terminating that relationship because uh, you feel like, well, I, I, I'm not supposed to break another person's heart. You know, there's just some things that we go through in life that, that, uh, that, that have a natural end to them. You know, and so we're going to kind of sort some of that stuff out. Well, when it comes to love specifically, you know, romantic love, it's very, very powerful, right? It is a, it, it brings with it some tremendous emotion. And uh, there's a lot of good to that, but there's also a lot of danger to that because with that emotion and with that incredible power that love has over us, sometimes we're brought to, to uh, a place where we will make reckless decisions, reckless choices, in our lives, right? Uh, almost all of us, if we've lived long enough on this earth, have done that. We have made a reckless choice for the sake of love, all right? Now, if you're here today with your spouse, I want you to look into their eyes right now, deep into their, deep and longingly into their eyes. Do it. I know you haven't done this in a long time, but, okay? You're looking at your spouse. Now, repeat after me. Say, you Say you, <laughs> now everybody's participating, that's great. Say you are crazy. Crazy. <laughs> How many of you wanted to say something else? How many of you that's exactly what you wanted to say? <laughs> they are, right? Especially you women. You can <laughs> you might have misinterpreted that. <laughs> oh, you're crazy because you let us live with you. Is that better? Is that, thank you. Oh. Oh, you uh, marriage is crazy, right? I mean, we, we, we get at an altar and we stand before a minister and before God and before our friends and family and we pledge our undying love to one another for the rest of our lives through thick and thin, through rich or poor, sickness and health, till death do us part, I will be with you. And that all feels so wonderful and great, right? But over the course of time, that relationship experiences peaks and valleys, doesn't it? Because that's, that's, that's humanity. That's, that's, that's what it does. Hopefully it's overall growing. But, um, but it's crazy. It's really crazy to think about uh, the fact that... that uh, that you, as a broken person, are going to try and make this thing work with another person. And, uh, and I'm telling you, ladies, thank you. Thank you for letting us, uh, letting us be married to you. But it is. It's crazy. Now, some of you brought children into the world. Another crazy adventure. Right? We bring life into this world. And, uh, boy, that is, that, that is full of, of challenges. Uh, it's full of wonderful, wonderful surprises. Right? And... and, and the fact that those relationships have with them just the potential to bring such tremendous satisfaction, you know, a healthy marriage relationship, it brings incredible satisfaction into a person's life. And a relationship with children, same thing. Relationships with friends, like deep relationships with, with friends uh, and, and with other people that, that, uh, that are part of your family. Those are, those are incredibly important things in our lives. And that's why it hurts so badly when, uh, when those relationships are, are used and abuse, when those relationships are, are taken advantage of by uh, another person. And uh, such a story takes place in the book of Judges. Now, in the Bible, the, the Jewish nation, the Israelites, uh, they, were, they were established to be a theocracy, meaning they were supposed to, they were supposed to uh, be organized under the direction and leadership of God. Okay, the theocracy. They didn't have a king. They, they had leaders like Moses led them out of Egypt and into, uh, into the wilderness. And then Joshua led them into the promised land. Right? But, but God was ultimately their, their superior. And down the road, eventually they cried out to the prophet, a, a guy who was you know, considered to be in charge and a, a person who spoke for God. They said, hey, we want a king. We want to be just like all the other nations around us. We're tired of getting beat up and defeated, and we need a king to lead us into battle, to lead us militarily, to lead us politically. And, uh, and, and so eventually they established a monarchy. Well, just prior to that, there's this period that we call the period of the judges. And so if you look in your Old Testament, you see a book, a whole book that's 
devoted to this period of time where God raised men and women to lead his people. And this is what happened. So the, the Jewish people, they would they turn their backs on God and they'd, they'd fall into sin and idolatry and immorality and all kinds of things. And eventually they, they lost God's blessing. And when they lost God's blessing, they would be infiltrated by other armies and other peoples, uh, most notably the Philistines, a constant pest to them. They would come and subjugate them and commit all kinds of atrocities on them. And then they would cry out to God and they'd say, God, deliver us from the hands of our enemies. And God would raise up a person and that person would, would lead uh, God's people back into a right relationship with him and freedom from whoever was impressing them at the time. Well, there's this one fellow by the name of Samson. And Samson was, uh, was uh, an ex extremely special person that God brought into the world. Uh, the Lord spoke to Samson's parents, and he told them that they would have a son, and he was going to be incredibly special and incredibly gifted. Uh, they, they were told that, that he was to fulfill uh, the laws of, of the Nazarite vow, the special vow that was taken by select people uh, that required certain restrictions of them, like they couldn't drink any alcohol, they couldn't touch anything that was unclean, they couldn't cut their hair. And, uh, and so he was to live under the mandate of this vow, and God was going to use him. Well, we find out in Samson that God gave him this supernatural strength, a strength that literally was otherworldly. It was like nothing that any mere mortal could possibly develop on their own. God gave him this strength, and he became a very, very difficult person for the Philistines who were oppressing and wanting to oppress and subjugate the Israelites. And the Philistines had had enough of, them, enough of him because they couldn't do anything about him. And so um, that's Samson. He's kind of rising up in influence and power and strength. But Samson had a, a weakness, a tremendous weakness, and that was he loved their women. He loved their women. Uh, the Bible tells us that he just, he really had a thing for the Philistine women. And, you know, Samson's parents, the Bible tells us, they went to him. They're like, Samson, why? Why? Can't you meet and marry a nice Jewish girl? Come on, Samson. You know, and they appealed to him over and over again to find somebody from their own people. But Samson had a thing for them. And one, at one point, he was betrothed to a woman. Uh, that didn't work out very well. You could read the story. Uh, later on, we find him sleeping with a prostitute. And then ultimately, we pick up on a story here where the Bible says that Samson fell in love. He fell in love with a woman named Delilah. How many of you have ever heard of Delilah before? How many of you have ever tempted to name your daughter Delilah when she was born? Uh, probably not. That name carries with it uh, some of the significance of her story. But Samson finds this woman. She's beautiful, and he is enraptured by, uh, by her very presence. He falls in love with her. The rulers of the Philistines, they found out, and they went to Delilah and said, entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up Securely, you see, it wasn't uncommon at all for ancient peoples to be extremely um, superstitious. And they knew, like, this guy's strength is not anything that he could have developed on his own. And they wanted to know what the secret was. And they said to Delilah, if you will do this, then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, we don't know exactly monetarily what that means, but we do know that it would set Delilah up. It would set up her entire family for life and probably for generations following. There was never going to be another financial need that they would ever experience. She would be free to get anything and everything out of this world that she could possibly want if she would do this one small favor for the leaders of the Philistines. So what did she do? Well, of course she went and said, no, I'm not going to do that. I love Samson, and we're meant to be together forever. I would never do such a thing. Did she do that? No, she didn't. Delilah instead went to Samson and she said, please, as she's fluttering her eyelashes at him, please tell me what makes you so strong and tell me what it would take to tie you up securely. Now, I don't want to take this to a place that it doesn't need to go, but <laughs> obviously the light bulb went on in Samson's mind and he thought he saw an opportunity here have a little fun. Samson told her, well, if I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not yet been dried, I'd become as weak as anyone else. And so the Philistine rulers brought Delilah seven new bowstrings, and the next time they got together, she tied him up with them. 
we'll let that just kind of rest where it is. That's all that needs to be said. I know there's children here today. Well, she had hidden some men in the inner room of the house, and she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. And Samson snapped the bowstrings as a piece of strength snaps when it is burned in the fire. And so the secret of his strength was not discovered. I imagine that in the hurry of all this, Delilah probably kind of read for fear of what might happen to her. But Samson destroys or, you know, beats up, beats on the Philistines. And afterward, <coughs> Samson probably sent Delilah a text message or something. Said, hey, what's up? You know, any, everything okay? Anything wrong? Eventually they get together again and Delilah said to him, you've been making fun of me, telling me lies. Now please tell me how you can be tied up securely. So Samson replied to her. He said, well, if I were tied up with seven, uh, with brand new ropes that had never been used, uh, then I would be as anyone else. And so Delilah took new ropes and she tied him up with them and the men were hiding as they had before. And again, Delilah cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But again, Samson snapped the ropes from his arms as if they were thread. Delilah said again the next time they got together, you've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. And Samson replied, if you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into the fabric of your loom and tighten it uh, with the loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. Now, many commentators have uh, for years uh, commented on just kind of the series of events here and have said, you know, poetically, that Samson's like flirting with this line. You know, he has this guarded secret that nobody's supposed to know and discover. And he's keeping it from her, but he inches closer and closer uh, to that line as he, now he begins, because in Samson's mind, he understands that his strength rests in this, this special calling that he has. And this calling is fulfilled through the covenant that he's made with God that has to do with his hair. And now he tells her that if she were to weave his hair, that he would lose his strength. You know, I think that Samson, as strong as a, of a man as he was, he had a weak heart. And he feared loneliness because of that weak heart, much like we do. You know, and I, I think as we read the story, we find Samson doing things that he shouldn't be comfortable doing. You know, he shouldn't be comfortable having these conversations with Delilah, unsure of what her motivations might be. And yet he is completely uh, uh, blinded by his love for her. And, and just like Samson, we, when our hearts are weak, and because our hearts are weak, right, because our hearts, they, they, they grow weak with, with love and with emotion. Like we sometimes don't make the wisest decisions with our minds because of the way our hearts may be leading us. And he feared loneliness to such a degree that he began doing things he wasn't comfortable doing. And the Bible says that while he slept, Delilah wove the seven braids of his hair into the fabric and then she tightened it with the loom shuttle. And again, she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson woke up, pulled back the loom shuttle, and yanked his hair away from the loom and the fabric. Well, next time, we find Delilah pouting. She says, how can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? Now, how many of you are just bewildered by Samson here? And you think, hey, if that were me... I would be smart enough, I'd be wise enough to understand what she's trying to do. And whether or not Samson did, whether or not he was just so overtaken with maybe even pride in his own strength, but certainly his love for Delilah, his fear of loneliness, Samson continues to engage and ultimately is going to make a decision that leads him to ruin. So she tells him, you've made fun of me three times now. You still haven't told me what makes you so strong. And she tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. There's a whole other sermon in that verse that we won't bother with today. But finally, Samson shared his secret with her. He's so tired of her pestering him. He so apparently trusted her enough or did not consider the secret of his strength important enough to hold on to any longer at the possibility 
that he might lose his relationship with her. And he said, my hair has never been cut, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite for birth. And if my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as anyone else. A weakened heart fears rejection. It fears not being, uh, not being accepted just for who you are. And it causes people in order to not feel that rejection, to start acting outside of who they are. Have you ever found yourself acting differently uh, among a certain group of people so that you could feel like you were a part of them? Maybe you changed your language, you changed your behavior, you changed uh, uh, the, way you, the way you were because you didn't want for them to reject you. You were afraid that if they, if they saw you for who you were, really were, that, that they just they wouldn't accept you, that they wouldn't like you. Right? And that's what Samson's doing here in this just outright desperate attempt to hold on to a relationship that he really had no business being in in the first place. It's like he couldn't help himself and he gave up his secret. You know, it was Clark Kent giving up the secret of his identity as Superman. Well, Delilah, she realized he'd finally told her the truth and so she sent for the Philistine rulers and she said, come back one more time because they were probably sick and tired of getting their butts kicked every time they came into the house. But she said, come back one more time, for he's finally told me his secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands. And Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap. And she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way, she began to bring him down. And his strength left him. Then she cried out, as she had three times before, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. And Samson, when he woke up, he thought, I will do as I have done before and shake myself free. But he hadn't realized the Lord had left him. The Philistines captured him. They gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. Obviously, there was a woman in the story trying to get something for herself. And she did it at the expense of another person. She took advantage of the affection and the love, whether properly put in her or not. She took advantage of that relationship. And the fact is, Delilah got everything she ever wanted. She got everything she could ever ask for in life. And it only cost her the price of just one heart. Just one heart. And she was able to have everything in the world she could ever want. And that's what happens sometimes in relationships when we're not careful. We can maybe not as drastically and as connivingly be like Delilah, but we can show the same kind of disregard for the relationships that God has brought into our lives. And what I want for us to understand from this message today is the fact that you and I have the responsibility to take into deep and sober consideration the hearts of those that are part of our lives, the hearts of our spouse, of our husband and our wife, the hearts of our children, the hearts of our parents, our brothers and our sisters, the hearts of our friends and family, the hearts of even those that God brings along our path, maybe just one time in our lives. We have to take into serious consideration the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, and the future of other people. I'm responsible for the heart of my wife. I'm responsible for the heart of my children. I'm responsible for the hearts of people that work for me, uh, people that I work for or on behalf of. We are responsible for the hearts of one another because a person's heart is a matter of life and death. What you do with a person's heart, it matters. How you handle it, how you treat it, it matters. How you how you go about either leveraging that relationship for your own gain or expressing the beauty and the graciousness of God through that relationship as you look out for the needs and the interests of that other person. The question is, am I going to reflect the character of Jesus Christ who gave everything for me, who didn't look out for his own interest, or am I going to just reflect the character of Josh Parrison? looking out only for what I want. The heart is a matter of life and death. We have the opportunity to speak and to breathe life into other people. And we have the ability to suck life out as well. 
So we got to avoid the life killers. Life killers like manipulation. You've been manipulated before. You know how it feels. Manipulation is the skillful handling or controlling of other people to get them to do what you want or to get them to give you something, right? Making them feel bad. It might be giving somebody the cold shoulder because they didn't act appropriately and you want for them to do everything they can to try to make the relationship right. Manipulation is a... It is, a, it is a tool that we use to take advantage of the heart and the affection of other people. And in doing that, we suck life out of that person. Exploitation is another tool that is used. Exploitation happens all over the world in just massive arenas where people are treated unfairly in order to build up the empires of a select few. And we have to realize any opportunity or chance or, 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 or undertaking that we're involved in, that we're not, we're not building up our own lives and our own net worth and our own livelihood at the unfair expense and ill treatment of other people. Have you ever belittled somebody before? God, help us in the words that we express to those that you bring into our lives that are part of our lives who are, we are responsible for. Help me not to belittle my wife. Help me not to belittle my husband. Help me not to belittle my children, my brother, my sister, my friends. Help me not to put other people down out of an air of superiority or feeling that I am better than he is or she is. Help my patience not to run so thin that I just am short. But God, would you just help me in the words that I express and the attitudes that I portray in my very behaviors to breathe life and to bring life into the lives of those that you've made part of my life. Avoid the life killers. And instead, Paul gives us the remedy and an understanding of what we're supposed to do when it comes to how we guard the hearts of those that we are called to love. It's kind of a, a, a re-saying of the golden rule. You remember the golden rule, right? We're told to do to others as we would have them do to us. Just treat other people the way you want to be treated and you'll find your relationships flourishing. It sounds like simple advice, and Paul expounds on that when he says, don't be selfish. How many of you are selfish here today? That's every one of us. That's every one of us. But he says, don't be selfish. Right? That, that natural proclivity that you have under the old nature, under the sinful nature, to want and to do anything you can to get your own way, don't do that. Don't be selfish. And don't try to impress others but be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves, preferring another person over yourself, doing to others as you would have them do to you, treating others the way you would want to be treated. And he says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to wake up every morning and think absolutely nothing for what I want. And just completely avoid anything that's going to make me feel good about myself. Right? It doesn't mean that I have to spend every waking moment thinking about how I'm going to do something good for others without any thought for my own health and well-being. He doesn't say that. But he does say, don't look out only for your own interests. But take an interest in others as well. There is a proactive nature to what we're being called to do there. Because, listen... We can, we can sometimes, we can do a good job of when, when a need flashes before our eyes of coming to the aid of that need, of being sympathetic and empathetic to people who are going through something. But the question is, well, how, how deliberate are we being in seeking the welfare, in seeking out the future and the life of those that God has given uh, their hearts to us? He's given us responsibility over the, the, the well-being of who that person is. And who are those people? Again, they're the people that you have relationships with. They're people that God brings across your way. They're people that you encounter in very casual ways. People at the grocery store. Or people in line while you're waiting at the DMV. Right? Wherever we may find ourselves. Understanding what I'm looking at is a person that God has created in his image. He has created that person for a purpose. He has created that person to, um, to experience him and all that he has for them. And he has a future in mind for them. So God forbid I ever do anything to bring any detriment whatsoever 
to the life and to the future of that person. But God instead use me to speak life into others. Use me to help bring people into a deeper understanding of who you are and what you have for their lives. And God, help me reflect the character of Christ in putting others' needs before my own. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, uh, we're challenged with, with uh, the kind of thing that we're talking about today throughout the day, every day of our lives. It's so much easier um, to give in to our natural tendencies than to be walking in the Spirit and being open to what, uh, to what you want for us to do. Lord, I pray that you would just bring each of us to a place where we cherish and honor the relationships that you've placed into our lives. Those relationships were intended to be a gift, not for our own self-use and manipulation. They were provided as a gift to us to bring a reflection of all that you want for us and the love that you have for us whether it's in a relationship involving romantic love or some kind of filial love between parents and children and siblings or a deep and intimate love in friendship. Lord, I pray that you would just help us never to take advantage of those relationships, of never manipulating circumstances and conversations so that we get our own way. But Lord, would you help us instead to put the needs of others before our very own needs? Would you help us to treat others the way we want to be treated? And in doing that, God, seek the peace of your kingdom. I pray that you would just build up in us uh, that, that, that tendency to, to do as Jesus did uh, and not as we in our old nature were inclined to do. Lord, we need your help for it. We need your strength. We need your guidance. We need for you to open our eyes to see things as you see them. And Lord, in doing that, God, we give you the glory and the praise for it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.